Hi, welcome to our wound care lab. I wanted to give you the opportunity to look at these slides before you came to the lab so we would have more time for some hands-on applications. Why is this topic important to student nurses? I know that many of you have been out in the clinical setting and as you go about your day you see that nurses are responsible primarily for the care of many complex wounds and if you think about it, it's really not just what should I put on the wound, it's the whole area of nursing responsibility. How do I assess this wound? How do I know if the wound's getting better or worse? What are the nursing implications as far as teaching? So this is a really important topic for nursing students. So as you well know, assessment is the first step of the nursing process. But as someone who's been a wound care nurse for many years, I'm often annoyed somewhat by the fact that many times we're just wrapped up in the fact of what dressing should I put in the wound. You know, do I use a hydrocolloid dressing? Do I use a hydrogel? Instead of looking at the entire patient holistically and determining what are the needs of the patient, and in turn, that tells us whether or not we're really assessing the needs of the wound. In other words, we need to look at the whole patient with a W, not just the hole in the patient. So what are some of the important things we need to assess? We need to do a focused nursing history and a complete nursing history. Think about it. We need to ask about nutrition. We know how important proteins are and other complex uh, nutrients in wound healing. So if a patient is not well nourished, if a patient is not eating, how do we expect the wound to heal? We need to look at hydration. We need to look at their oxygen vascular status. If someone's pulse ox is very, very low and we're treating them for multiple chronic illnesses, is that wound really able to be healed at this point? Do we need to address some other issues first? Think about some other contributing illnesses. We know that wound healing is impaired in our diabetic patients. We know it's in impaired in someone who's immunocompromised. Therefore, these are also issues we need to address. We need to look at the contributing factors. If we're looking at a pressure ulcer, is the patient sitting on that wound all day long? Have we addressed the issue of pressure? Have we looked at shear? Have we looked at friction? Have we looked at their mobility status? Is physical therapy involved? Is the dietitian involved? Are some of the medications impacting whether or not this wound will heal? And perhaps most importantly, the patient needs to be involved. What are their goals for this wound? And what is their overall prognosis? We also need to look at the local area of the wound. You know, we often say it has a scab, or it looks red, or it looks swollen. What does that mean for healing? What can I do as a nurse to address some of these local issues? And we're going to be talking about these local issues in more depth when we get into class. So let's look at ways that we can assess the wound. Remember, stages are used only for pressure ulcers. Let me say that again. We only stage pressure ulcers. So if you're not sure what type of wound it is, it's much easier to assess a wound and determine if it's partial thickness or full thickness. And what is a partial thickness wound? A partial thickness wound is any wound that has tissue destruction through the epidermis extending into but not through the dermis. And how does this heal? It heals by epithelialization and contraction of wound margins. Now, if you look at the pictures here and you see the blister, we've all had blisters. Do we need a wound care consult? No, we're healthy. We throw in a band-aid and a couple of days later the, the blister has healed. But if you look at that same blister in someone who's 95, immobile and malnourished, it may take a longer period of time for that blister to heal. We also need to determine if it's something is full thickness. And full thickness wounds are tissue destruction extending through the dermis to involve the subcutaneous tissue and possibly muscle and bone. These are the deep, deep wounds. And how do they heal? Well, we know they just don't heal overnight. The wound needs to fill up with granulation tissue, then the wound needs to contract, and finally we have reepithelialization or we have resurfacing of the wound. And if you look, there's many different types of full thickness wounds. Stage three and four pressure injuries, diabetic ulcers, open surgical wounds, you could have a traumatic wound. All of these would be full thickness.
stage three and stage four pressure injuries versus a full thickness wound. This is important for you to realize. All stage three and four pressure injuries are full thickness wounds, but not all full thickness wounds are pressure injuries. And we often get into trouble. I know students want to stage everything. And again, I'm reiterating, it's only pressure ulcers that get staged. Surgical arterial venous and other wounds do not get staged. These wounds are classified as either partial or full thickness. This is a great monomic to look at when you're looking at a wound, and I thought it was really easy for students to realize there are some shorter ones. But what is the first step of the nursing process? Assessment. So if you break down that word, it kind of tells you how to look at a wound. Where is the wound located? How old is the wound? First S, what is the size, shape, and stage if indicated? Are there sinus tracts? If there's sinus tracts, then we know by default it's a full thickness wound. Is there exudate? What is exudate? That's the drainage. Is it septic? Is the patient septic? Do the patient have a temp? Is the wound drainage purulent? How does the surrounding skin look? Is there maceration? Maceration we've all seen. You take a bath and you come out and your skin is that boggy, pale white. And often that happens for some of the wounds if patients are incontinent. We need to address that. What do the edges look like? Are they rolled? Is there a possibility for re-epithelialization? Is there necrotic tissue in the wound? How does the tissue bed look? And the tissue bed is the actual open area of the wound that we're going to be looking at. And status means what's the overall status of the patient. And a good thing to remember, and I always tell this story, I once had a patient who had a profound diabetic ulcer. And the patient's blood sugars were not well controlled, and this patient refused to take insulin. So therefore, after multiple conversations, the patient finally realized that if the blood sugars were not controlled, this wound would never heal, which is what I mean by looking at the entire patient when you're doing a wound assessment. So let's look at assessment by color, and this is actually the easiest way to assess a wound. We look at red, yellow, black. And a red wound is a healthy wound. It means it's getting oxygen, it means it's getting nutrients, it has a really good prognosis for healing. A yellow wound means it's half and half. Sometimes a yellow wound might be covered by what we call slough, which is desiccated dead tissue. So the wound here in this picture has about 60% slough, which is desiccated dead tissue, yellow, gray, brown, and 40% granulation tissue. The other color we use is a black wound. And you can have a dry black wound or a moist draining black wound. And these two pictures are indications of that. A dry black wound is leathery eschgar, which really does look like leather. And the other type of black wound there is a soft boggy eschgar, which is really covering purulent drainage. And that's an indication of a wound that's uh, infected. Deep tissue injury, this is the long definition, and you can read this, but essentially what deep tissue injury is, is that due to pressure or other damage, the wound is actually not open. There's injury to the deep muscle, and we need to really keep an eye on this wound because many times it's going to wind up being full thickness, and I'm going to talk about this more in class. Here's pictures of deep tissue injury, and it often looks like a rug burn or somebody who was laying on it laying on it for a long period of time. This often happens at the end of life. So the skin, the surface of the skin might be intact, but just looking at that skin, you could see that underneath there's a lot of damage. And once you have damage to the muscle, once the muscle has suffered from ischemia or lack of oxygen, it's very difficult for that muscle to come back. There's another type of wound category that you see, and it's moisture-associated skin damage. This often happens in our patients that are incontinent or patients that have any type of skin damage due to moisture. And you can see from the grid here on the slide what happens to these patients. These are often misclassified as pressure injuries, and it increases the prevalence of pressure injuries in acute and long-term care. But this is an entirely different type of wound, and the care needs to be addressed differently. And we're going to talk about that in class. Let's talk about some of the assessments you're going to make when you actually have the wound in front of you. You need to measure all wounds, and we measure them length times width times depth. And what I always tell students is use a clock face. That the wound that's the, the top of the wound closest to the patient's head, that would be 12 o'clock. The lower part of the wound closest to the patient's feet would be 6 o'clock, and then by default you have 9 and 3.
So you'd want to measure that. And then in this wound, you see they have the ruler and they're measuring the wound. We also need to look at depth, and this is often frightening for students. So you want to have someone with you when you first do this. You want to use a Q-tip, the long applicators. Q-tip is a brand name, so you want to use the applicators. And you want to put it very gently into the deepest portion of the wound, and then you want to measure how much is depth into the wound. The other relationship is undermining, and undermining is what's going on on the side of the wound, similar to depth. The other part that you'll see there is sinus tracts or tunneling. Those are actually tunnels that go from the bottom of the wound, and I'm going to show those in class to make it more uh, significant for you. And then the, perhaps the most important thing, which I should have put first, is pain. You know, we used to think that when wounds got to be full thickness, they were not painful, and we're realizing more and more that that is definitely not true. So your patients with big open chronic wounds or your patient with a small wound could all have a degree of pain, and we know that pain is the fifth vital sign. It's very important to assess for pain, and if you're going to be doing a dressing where the patient may have an increase in pain, you want to address their pain issue beforehand. We also want to assess the drainage of the wound, and here's some pictures of what wound drainage looks like. The first one is serous drainage, which is expected. The second one is serosanguinous, a lot of drainage there, but it may be benign depending upon the circumstance. The third one is sanguinous, which is bloody, bloody drainage, and that last one is purulent drainage, and purulent drainage is an indication of an infection. Debridement. We use debridement when we have a necrotic wound that is septic or we have a chronic wound that despite other types of treatment has not been uh, able to be remove the eschar and this is typically done in an operating room session setting or at the bedside and we use sharp instruments to remove the necrotic tissue. Now, there's a lot of pros and cons to this, and there's a lot of indications and contraindications. So therefore, one of the most important things you need to do is you need to address the pain issue that may occur before this patient has undergoes a debridement. We also need to look at the patient's what? Bleeding and clotting factors, because if we're going to be cutting into tissue, we want to make sure that this patient has the ability to clot afterwards. So sharp debridement, we use instruments to remove necrotic tissue. Autolytic debridement, we're using dressings to remove necrotic tissue, and I'm going to explain that when we talk about dressings in class. And enzymatic debridement, we use chemicals to remove necrotic tissues. And many of you have had the opportunity to do this. Often in the hospital, we use a very famous enzymatic debrider called Santal, and I know that some of you may have had the opportunity to do Santal dressings, where you're starting to remove the slough and that yellow drainage in a wound. So there's many nursing diagnoses and there's many goals of care. So every patient is unique and you need to modify your diagnosis and your goal of care based upon your patient. I just put down a couple here. And then again, we need to look at what are we planning on curing this wound? Will this wound heal? Or is it something that we're going to need to maintain and keep from becoming infected? We need to look at pain management, and we're always, always, always using interdisciplinary care and multidisciplinary care. We want to get everyone involved who can ultimately help this patient. So we're talking physical therapy. We might be talking occupational therapy. We might be talking home health care. And we're definitely talking about consult with the dietitian and perhaps the surgeon. So... Part two is going to be in lab, where we're going to be talking about various wounds and topical therapies. So, brief overview. This is all in your textbook, and it's also all in your self-learning module, many of the aspects that we're going to be talking about in class. So, I hope this clarified some of the content, and I hope to see you in lab. Take care.